Hi again, and welcome to Writer's Read. And remember, these will be shown on Monday evenings at 7 o'clock on Channel 370. I just want to mention that at the beginning of each one of the reading events, you'll hear the sound of a typewriter. And if you've watched Hemingway at all, you'll see Hemingway's typewriter making that sound. So listen for the sound of the typewriter. Okay, we get started, of course, by knowing our readers' names, Audrey and Anne. And we also get started by saying Paul's poem. And I think I almost have it completely memorized, Paul. <laughs> Here we go. I say a line, you say a line. Right, right, right. Right, right, right. Until you get it right. Until you get it right. Then read aloud. Then read aloud. You'll draw a crowd. You'll draw a crowd. And bring them great delight. And bring them great delight. And let's get started today. I've invited our readers to give thought to the writing process they use and maybe share just a tidbit of how they get started, when do they write, morning or evening, what do they do when they get stuck, and so we'll start with Audrey Weitkamp with that question. Would you share with us a little bit, Audrey, of your process of writing? Sure. Um, I'm going to be reading today from the Dalmatian Spots. Uh, this is a, a book I wrote, uh, and it, I'll be reading six pages. It's self-published, and it's total about 70. Um, I've written about 20 such travel accounts and I use pretty much the same method. Um, when we get home from a trip, and they're usually month-long independent trips, um, I reread the diary that Bill and I have kept. Um, one of us is the tour guide, and the other one is the diarist, and we trade every day. Uh, then I look at all the pictures, and then if I need some facts, some numbers, something like that, uh, then I would go and go back to a guidebook or a history book, whatever. Um, I write the text first, and I usually do about three drafts uh, until it flows. Then I pick out the pictures, and then I design the book. Um, this one was written um, with myself, I'm formatting it completely. Uh, recently, I've used a self-publisher called Blurb, and it produces a much more uh, commercial-looking, professional product, and it's easier to design. Um, <clears throat> um, I chose Split, uh, just this one tiny section of this account, uh, for a couple reasons. One is that because so many of us are watching the Rome programs on great courses, this will uh, tell you more about the Roman Empire. And um, the second is that I, there are some parts of this I particularly wanted to read I thought you'd enjoy. Split is a city on the Dalmatian coast of Croatia. And Croatia, which used to be part of Yugoslavia, is right across the Adriatic Sea from Italy. It was part of the Roman Empire. So I'll, I'll begin. Split, a city in a palace. When our ferry landed in Split, we had a choice of finding an apartment uh, either by going to a private travel agency and pay extra for the service, or go with one of the prospective apartment owners who meet the ferries. Um, this was, uh, it was my day, and I chose to go the informal method. 
we hadn't stepped more than 20 feet from the ferry dock, uh, from the gangplank, when we were approached by a very nice looking woman who showed us pictures of the apartment she had available. She said that it was in a cluster of medieval buildings just outside Diocletian's palace, the focus of our sightseeing in Split, and the price seemed reasonable for such a convenient location. I was quite taken aback by the photo showing a design of red and black tiles in the bathroom and bright graphics painted on one corner of the bedroom wall. It looked like a cheerful place. We followed her across the Riva, the wide uh, waterfront promenade, and through an ancient looking archway. We heard to keep up with her as she walked through a maze of narrow streets. After many confusing turns, we arrived at a tall, narrow building on a quiet cul-de-sac. As she led us up to the first floor of, up the first floor of steep stairs, she explained that her sister Mary managed the apartment and lived on the second floor. Mary, the sister, was not quite so businesslike and cultivated, but was loud and boisterous. She spoke English with a heavy Slavic accent and reminded me of someone in a politically incorrect skit on a TV comedy show. <laughs> After the sister excused herself to go back to work, Mary led us up two more flights of stairs and stopped to unlock a door. Then we followed her up yet one more short flight that led directly into a small garret apartment. As she proudly showed off the features of the tiny apartment, she kept assuring us that everything was new and first rate. Dishes all new. <laughs> Refrigerator I just bought. She yanked open the wooden folding door of the bathroom and proclaimed shower, toilet, all new. Somehow the colorful red and black tile design had, that had looked so attractive in the photos rather overwhelmed the small spaces, making the apartment with its steeply slanted ceiling rather claustrophobic. If we hadn't already dragged our suitcases up four flights of stairs and had not a clue where we were in the relation to the main tourist streets, I would have thanked her and gone looking for the quietly efficient services of a travel agency. I looked over at Bill to see what he thought, but he just shrugged his shoulders. We'll take it, I told Mary, and she beamed. As soon as she left, Bill headed for the bathroom, and after a fair amount of effort managed to engage the hook, locking the door. A few minutes later, when he tried to leave the bathroom and unlock the door, it was impossible. Finally, he said through the stubbornly jammed door, you'll have to get Mary and tell her I'm locked in the bathroom. Mary seemed more amused than apologetic about the stuck door and managed to get it open by giving the handle a great wallop. Be careful of luck, she assured us, as if our carelessness were the problem and not the ill-fitting installation of the cheap door. When I showed her that without locking it, the accordion fold door, design of the door, caused it to slowly open. <laughs> she looked perplexed. Your husband? Wife? No problem nodded as if uh, she had been explaining this obvious missing base of logic. For the next five days we were leery of using the bathroom, uh, getting locked in the checkerboard bathroom and whenever one of us would use it we'd mutter to ourselves, no problem, 
and try to ignore the slowly widening gap of the door. There were other idiosyncrasies to the apartment because there was neither a chest of drawers nor any hooks or hangers. We lived out of our suitcases, which took up a precious floor space. The kitchen was practically useless because the space between the wall and the front of the small efficiency kitchen was so narrow that although a reasonably thin person could stand before the sink and stove, neither the cabinet doors nor the door on the small refrigerator could be completely opened. If the apartment had been rented to anyone before us, they must never have used the kitchen because the price tags were still on the couple of pans, the mixing spoon, and the dish towel. We used the kitchen for just two simple breakfasts of yogurt, juice, and rolls, and we would have been better off renting a soba, a room without a kitchen. It would have been cheaper and maybe even larger. We had been spoiled in our accommodations in Dubrovnik, Mostar, Korchula, and Havar. We weren't so unhappy about the apartment that we were willing to spend time looking for another place to stay. It was a convenient location, and we told Mary when we arrived that we'd be staying for five days. Besides, it gave us a view into another slice of Croatia, more working class than we'd experienced before, and it made our stay in Split in unforgettable in a way that a comfortable, tastefully decorated apartment wouldn't have. Bill and I would sometimes lie in bed in the morning and giggle at the absurdity of the excessive use of the red and black decorations or the almost unusable kitchen. To top it off, we were ser serenaded in the mornings by the deep, mournful bark of Mary's puppy. When Mary first described her sweet little puppy, I pictured something cute and petite, possibly even a Dalmatian puppy. We'd been looking for the spotted dogs ever since we arrived on the Dalmatian coast. No such luck. Mary's puppy was big and all white. More teenager than puppy, <laughs> with big feet and over-eager enthusiasms. Only Mary could call him cute. When he was sprawled on the staircase outside Mary's apartment, it was difficult to either move him or step over him because he weighed at least 90 pounds. Mary proudly showed us his papers, which she had framed and hung on the wall of her apartment. They attested that the puppy was a purebred Argentinian something or another, a breed we'd never heard of. Actually, a petite puppy would have looked silly with Mary who herself was a bigger-than-life character. Several times when we'd return from our day sightseeing, we'd see her drinking beer with friends at a small neighborhood cafe just around the corner from our building. She always greeted us enthusiastically when she saw us. We wondered which of her friends had helped her paint the decorations on the ceiling and if any had tried to point out that there really wasn't room for a usable kitchen. She probably would have laughed and said, no problem, and promised them a cold beer if they would help her carry the studio kitchen up the four flights of stairs. <laughs> now I'm going to go on to the, the palace. Reading simple descriptions of Split and seeing my friend Lisa's pictures had left me puzzled about a whole section of the city could be built within the Diocletian Palace. Palace is really a misnomer because it's a Roman walled city surrounded by a medieval neighborhood embedded in a large modern industrial city called Split. 
not all of the walls and all of the buildings of the palace are still standing. And some of the larger buildings have been subdivided and converted to other uses. But enough of the original historic architecture remains that it gives Split a unique character. Diocletian was a Roman army general before he became emperor in the year 284. After ruling the empire for 20 years, he retired to the Dalmatian coast where he had been born. He used the plan of a typical Roman army camp, a castrum, to build his retirement palace just three miles from his hometown of Salona. The palace was vast, 705 feet long, 590 feet wide, and was enclosed by strong walls, some of them 90 feet high. Towers stood at each corner, and several small towers reinforced each wall. Gates in three of the walls opened onto Roman roads, and the fourth onto the sea. Inside the wall nearest the sea were the royal apartments, and behind them was a religious section that contained a huge mausoleum intended for his burial. Close by were two circular temples, one dedicated to Venus and one to Sybil, and a rectangular temple dedicated to Jupiter. In the rear of the walled palace enclosure, farthest from the water, were the necessary storerooms, workshops, and lodgings for the 700 bodyguards, soldiers, and servants that kept the emperor safe and comfortable. We used this, uh, this, the self-guided tour in Rick Steve's guidebook to explore the palace, beginning out on the Riva, the handsome white waterfront. 800 years ago, when Diocletian lived here, the sea came right up to the base of the wall. Standing on the pavement, at, uh, looking up, with our back to the sea, we looked up at the palace facade, and along the top were 42 stone window frames. During Diocletian's time, the windows would have provided splendid views of the sea and its busy Roman traffic. The brass gate was the original seafront entrance through the wall. We walked through that gate and entered the 20 foot, uh, 25 foot high vaulted cellars below the sprawling building that housed the royal apartment. Over the course of the centuries, the cellars filled with water from two springs one fresh, one sulfurous, and also from the sea. During medieval times, people living in the building above cut holes in the floor and used them as garbage disposals, filling the cellar with all manner of garbage. In the 1950s, when the cellars were emptied, archaeologists found the garbage and trash extremely interesting. Now the cellars are clean and dry, and their high vaulted ceilings make attractive exhibition space for flower shows, art shows, and the like. When we climbed out of the cellar, we found ourselves in the peristyle, a ceremonial uh, entrance court. It was the main square of the walled palace in Diocletian's time, because two Roman roads intersected there. Adjoining it was the Proteron, a raised area in front of the entrance to Diocletian's apartments. As part of the state of religion, Roman emperors were worshiped as gods, and Diocletian used, uh, chose the name Jovius, son of Jupiter, for his sacred identity. The large building, built as his mausoleum, was used while he was alive as a temple to Jovius with an altar, priests, the whole nine yards. 
four times a year, Diocletian, in his persona as Jovius, presented himself to the assembled crowd of the, on the Protrian for their veneration. The people prostrated themselves on the ground before him, and the most, inter most important among them were allowed to kiss the hem of his robe. It would have been an impressive show full of pomp and ceremony. As we looked around the peristyle, we didn't see any pros, uh, prostrate worshipers, unless you counted the fatigued tourists sprawled on the stone benches. A couple of handsome young men dressed like Roman soldiers were busy talking to the tourists and posing for pictures. Street performers, a magician, and a puppeteer entertained a gaggle of children who sat on the pavement of the old Roman road. Orienting ourselves with a guidebook map, we identified the main Roman buildings around us. Nearest was the building once used as Diocletian's mausoleum. After the Roman Empire fell and Christianity replaced the religion of the Romans, Diocletian's body was removed from his mausoleum and the body of St. Dominus was placed there. Diocletian's mausoleum <clears throat> had become the cathedral of St. Dominus. Ironic because Diocletian was infamous for his savage treatment of the early Christians. To celebrate his retirement, he had St. Dominus Bishop Dominus at the time, uh, as well as several thousand Christians killed in a great bloody extravaganza. Gods had changed in the other temples as well. The Temple of Jupiter had become the baptistry of St. John. We entered another of the small pagan temples, now housing the god of tourism, and bought a good map. The building that had housed the royal apartments had many new uses, including a modern nightclub called the Black Cat. Unlike most Roman ruins, Diocletian's palace had rarely been empty. After the emperor died, the Roman governor moved in, and the many buildings continued as a Roman administrative center. Then in the seventh century, when the Avars Slavic invaders attacked Salona, a city of about 60,000 people at that time. Those people moved into the palace, the wealthiest moving into his apartments and the others finding shelter wherever they could. Even while Diocletian lived in his palace, a Roman village grew up outside the Iron Gate and its main square became the main square of medieval split. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. That was wonderful. Now, Audrey, what do we do if we want to read more? Do we give you a call? Yes. Um, you would be able to share us yes, a copy? Yes, I would. I haven't put them in the, in the uh, library because yeah. I, I really don't want to lose them, but I do yeah. have a few copies of okay. all. And so, We've traveled in um, a lot by bicycle all over the world, and I've written those. Oh and then uh, the last few years, um, I, we've traveled yes. independently really? or on a, a tour for a few times. But I've usually written written them up. Oh, that would be delightful. So you don't mind getting a few phone calls? No, I don't. Oh, good. Thank okay, you. thanks so much, Audrey. Okay, oh my goodness, the description of that apartment. One would wonder whether to keep it or not. I can understand them debating whether they should keep it or not. <laughs> Hi, Anne. Hello. Good to see you. Thank you. And looking forward to hearing your voice and your words. Tell us about your process of writing and what little tidbit you might share with us today. Well, I can't imagine that I have any process that every other writer hasn't had. But I have one thing I do that I don't know if they all do, and that is that I collect names. 
You know, when you write short stories, you need a lot of names. So when the residents of Horizon House are talking about their sister-in-law or their grandson that has a really wonderful name, don't be surprised if it turns up in a story. That's wonderful, Anne. Oh, let's hear your story. Okay, this is called The Loaf of Bread. If Wendell Phillips hadn't worn his bright red, yellow, bright, oh, this is a good start, bright yellow cowboy shirt on that summer day, it's likely that Cindy would never have figured out what was going on. After leaving the Warrens' foster care home, she turned right at the next corner and pulled over in the middle of the block to record some notes from the monthly visit. A flash of yellow caught her eye, and she watched as the eight-year-old ran hard and fast through the backyard of his foster home, crossed the yard behind, and disappeared between the houses. Cindy rolled her car forward until she was almost at the next corner and arrived just in time to see Wendell fly into the arms of his mother. So that's it, thought Cindy. He sees her all the time maybe every day. I'm sure Mrs. Warren doesn't know about this. Cindy was actually relieved. In her office, Wendell's visit with his mother had been very strange. They both seemed to feel awkward and slightly nervous. They must have been afraid I'd guess their secret, she thought. Cindy was a careful and accurate observer of children. She grew up the oldest of 10 kids in a family where the older ones basically raised the younger ones. She could tell when a child was afraid of his parents, but he was begging to go home. And she could tell when a child was happy and safe in miserable physical circumstances. This insight was her chief tool in her job in foster care placement, and this case had really confused her. But now the mystery was solved. She watched Wendell and his mother cross the street to the small neighborhood park and sit close together on the bench. When she got to her office, Cindy called Mrs. Warren and told her what she'd seen. Well, he sure had us both fooled, didn't he? Every day at the same time he asked to go outside. As hot as it gets in this house, I don't like to see him keep him inside all day. He's never gone more than a few minutes. They probably just sit there and hold hands. He loves her so much. Everyone in your neighborhood knows everyone else. I'm surprised no one told you. It don't surprise me. They don't like me doing this. They say I'm making money off other people's misfortune. Cindy, well aware of the neighbor's attitudes toward foster care, changed the subject. Any idea how Mrs. Phillips gets here every day? It's five miles from where she lives. Probably rides the bus, was all Mrs. Warren would say. Don't say anything to Wendell about us knowing this, okay? I haven't decided quite how to handle it. Later, Cindy walked into her supervisor's office and she said, I'm sending Wendell Phillips home. Tom Whalen looked puzzled. You're sending a lot of kids home. Is your caseload too much for you? I bet if I sent them all home, only a few would come back in foster care. Most parents want their kids, Tom. Does it ever occur to you that if you sent them all home, you'd be out of a job? It'd be worth it. There are easier ways to make a living. Back at her desk, she pulled out the folder for Wendell's case and looked at the original intake paperwork. She used to think she might do more good as an intake worker, determining whether children should go into foster care in the first place. But after several years on the job, she realized that time apart helped the whole family understand how important they were to each other. The real problem was that kids got lost in the system and stayed too long. Cindy felt it was her job to be sure that didn't happen. The police report said that the mother hadn't been home for two days when the seven-year-old Negro male went to the corner store and asked to borrow a loaf of bread. The store owner had tried to locate the mother. When he couldn't, he called the police. 
It was unusual for that to happen in a black neighborhood. In rural southern Illinois in the late 1960s, black families tended to solve their own problems. If a child was being mistreated, another family would take him in, and he might or might not ever go home, depending on whether the situation improved. It turned out that Mrs. Phillips was new in the neighborhood and that she and her son lived alone. When the young mother was found, she seemed very surprised to hear what had happened. Her first interview with Cindy, she said when, that Wendell, Wendell was so smart that she thought he'd be fine. And he was, except that right away he ate up all the food she left for him. And after a day without food, he was hungry. Mrs. Phillips would never explain why she left Wendell alone, and he'd now been in foster care over a year. She'd been begging for her son to come home. It was the strange office visits that made Cindy hesitate. Cindy wasn't paid to do criminal investigation, but often she sought out the players in scenarios that hurt a child. This time she wanted to know exactly what had happened. On her way home that evening, she stopped by the store. It was a typical corner bandit, so named in her town because everything in the store was overpriced and the closest full service grocery was three miles away. As she approached the front counter, the old man was tense and scowling. She briefly wondered why he would take that attitude and then realized she'd walked directly from the door to the cash register. To him, that would mean trouble of one kind or another. Mm. Whew, it's a hot day out there, she said sympathetically. And the refrigerator cases put out a lot of heat, don't they? I see why you have the door propped open. My folks had a small town grocery until a big chain drove us out of business. The man behind the counter said, what your name? Cindy Manasian. Ah. Armenian. Yes. You go to college? The first one in my family. We have same thing here. Son, go to college. Good. That's good. He can take care of you someday. Yes. What's your name? Ahmed Kanik. Ah, Turkish. Old enemy. Not in this new country. Here we have to stick together, don't we? They smiled at one another. Mr. Connick, why do you charge so much for groceries? He eased himself down onto the stool behind the counter, making Cindy wonder how old he was. Probably not as old as he looked, and she could see he'd been asked this question before. People live near here can't go far for fresh food. Only beer do deliver here for free. Nighttime, me and wife close at nine, and next morning we go to wholesaler at five. We too late, we go to Kroger. We pay cash for each thing. Fresh food not sell, we lose our money. Put up price. We saved to bring my brother over to help us. Now he worked two part-time jobs and give us money from every check to pay taxes and lights. It's hard work, seven days. They were quiet for a few minutes. Why you come in? I'm the social worker for the young boy whose mother left him alone and hungry. When he came in here, you gave him some bread. He steal a loaf of bread and I catch him. But you told the police you gave it to him. Enough trouble with the missing mother. And he hungry. You ever be hungry? Two days without food hungry? No, never. Because you grew up in this country. Hungry hurts. Pain so you not think straight. Do bad things. Did you know the boy before this happened? Yes. Good boy. Good mother. What happened, I don't know. Mrs. Phillips won't say what happened, but she promises it won't happen again. Believe her. I do. Thank you, Mr. Kanick. You've helped me understand. I'll do what I can for the boy. Next time, keep him here and call me. She handed him her card. Won't be a next time. You know this? I know this. The next morning, 
Noting that Wendell's birthday was coming up on Saturday, Cindy reached for the phone. When Mrs. Phillips answered, she said, This is Cynthia Manasian, Children and Family Services. I'd like to try some home visits for Wendell. If these go well, we could send him home before school starts. There was silence on the other end. Cindy wondered if she could be wrong. Could it be that this mother didn't really want the child? She listened and heard the sound of sobbing. She waited. Finally, Mrs. Phillip respo re responded in a shaky voice. That'd be so wonderful. God bless you, Miss Cindy. Putting on her stern voice of authority, Cindy said, we'll have to see how it goes, you know. One day at a time. How about if I bring him to you on Friday and he stays the weekend? Tom walked by her desk later that afternoon and saw her surrounded by piles of papers. That can only be the Barnes file, he said. Yep. Now don't you go sending all those kids home. They're all home but one. Good God, when did that happen? One at a time over the last two years when you weren't looking? <laughs> Tom grinned and shook his head. How are they doing? Fine, Cindy said, giving up the idea of cutting the conversation short. They each have short chores to do, and the house looks better than when those two poor parents were by themselves. And the oil company has your phone number to call if the heating bill isn't paid. Tom looked out the window. I'll never forget those five, five raggedy red-headed kids huddled in the corner of that freezing house. That was one of the few times I was afraid of a man. Mr. Barnes has a terrible temper. And if someone tried to take your son out of your house, what would you do? I'd kill him, he said flatly, and walked away. Friday afternoon, Cindy went to pick up Wendell at his foster home. She parked where he had met his mother and walked around the block. Mrs. Warren and Wendell were waiting for her, but seemed surprised to see her without a car. Mind if we go out the back door, Cindy said, and took Wendell's hand. The foster mother looked worried, but she didn't say anything. Over Wendell's head, Cindy winked at Mrs. Warren. As they crossed the backyard, Cindy asked Wendell if he knew where she was taking him. He smiled shyly. Yes, ma'am, I'm going home for a visit, and then I might get to go home for good. This is happening because Mrs. Warren says you're a good boy, and your teacher told me that you did very well in school last year, and your mother has promised that she'll never leave you overnight again. Yes, ma'am. Do you know why we're walking this way? Do you? Well, I suspect it's because you know we were doing something wrong, and you want me to know you know. Smart kid. That's right, she said. He hung his head and started to cry. Cindy stopped and put her hands on his shoulders. Don't be afraid. I understand you want to go home. It must seem like it's your fault that all this happened because you stole the bread in the first place. He glanced at her quickly and looked away. They resumed their walk, and when they were settled in the car, he asked, Why are you letting me have a home visit if what we were doing was so bad? Wendell, there are rules in this world, and I believe you've learned the hard lesson that going around the world on, around the rules only leads to more trouble. Your teachers and Mr. Warren, Mrs. Warren and Mr. Kanick and I believe you're a good boy who will become a good man. It's time for you to go home. So what do you want to do to celebrate your retirement, Tom said. Are you buying? Well, sure, just this once. For the first and last time, you mean. They both laughed. I hear there's a new bakery cafe in town, and I'm thrilled. Finally, some decent bread. Let's go there. Cindy had been so busy winding up her cases and finishing her paperwork that she hadn't had time to figure out who had the courage to start a new business in that old section of town. It wasn't until they drove up the street that she realized the bakery was attached to Mr. Canick's grocery store. And there was a line out the door. 
They parked and got in line, Cindy making a metal, mental note to stop by the grocery on her way out. She needn't have bothered because there at the bakery cash register was Mrs. Canick. And peering from the kitchen was Wendell Phillips, all six feet, 200 pounds of him, and his mother, both covered with flour and beaming. Miss Cindy, they exclaimed. The place was crowded with workers who had come across town for sandwiches and pastries. There wasn't time to talk, but Cindy got a moment to hug Wendell and whisper, delicious, after their lunch. They walked they, through the adjoining doorway into the grocery store and discovered Mr. Canick restocking his large produce section from what appeared to be a recent delivery. When he saw Cindy and Tom, he gestured toward the produce and explained that since Wendell needed a lot of fresh produce for his sandwiches and salads, he could get it delivered and he ordered enough for the grocery too. As if to answer Cindy's unspoken question, he said, I put prices down, do more business. But Mr. Canick, how did you two do, did, do this? Me and my brother own this building now. I co-sign and Wendell get what you call small business money for fix up empty space. Tom looked perplexed. Didn't Wendell go to the college on a football scholarship? Yes, but he was a business major, and he wanted to bake. It's good, yes? Cindy was laughing with delight. Oh, yes, it's perfect. And Mrs. Phillips? She makes the best dinner rolls in Illinois, he exclaimed. People drive from Belleville to get. She make all the bread. He make all the pastries. My wife make the salads. And your son, Mr. Canick? He work at the bank, he said, with a wide grin. On the way back to the office, Tom said, well, there's one of your big successes. Cindy was uncharacteristically quiet, and Tom, who had expected one of her sharp remarks, enjoyed the moment. But she only said, they need a sign. I wonder what they're going to call the cafe. I asked, and Wendell said the sign will be ready next week. It's going to be called the Stolen Bed Bread Bakery and Cafe. <laughs> Stolen? Gasped Cindy. No, Cindy. Stolen. Stolen. <laughs> you know, the German bread with the nuts and the dried fruit. The kind the old German bakery on Main Street used to make for the holidays. He's going to make it a specialty of the house. Recovering her composure, Cindy exclaimed, what a great idea. There are a lot of old German immigrants in town who still talk about that place. I always knew he was a smart kid. Tom could tell she was looking at him as he was driving. What? You knew he stole that bread, didn't you? <laughs> I had a hunch. Why didn't you say something? I could never tell you anything about managing your caseload or anything else for that matter. Do you know you just went through a stop sign? <laughs> a siren beeped briefly behind them and Tom pulled over the curb and pulled out his driver's license. I do now, Tom said. Hello, officer, what did I do? Well, sir, you were going 35 in a 25 mile an hour per zone and you went right through the stop sign at 3rd and Union. Oh, hi, Miss Cindy. Hi, Jeffrey, how's your mom? She's better, ma'am, but she still misses Dad something terrible. Please tell her hello for me and that she's in my prayers. Will do, Miss Cindy. So as I was saying, sir, I'm writing you a warning citation. The school is nearby, you know. Thank you, officer. As they drove away, Tom was obviously relieved to get only a warning. Who was that? Jeffrey Barnes. Couldn't you tell by the red hair? Sweet <laughs> kid. I'm going to miss you, Cindy. I can't believe this is your last day. Why don't you come over for dinner next Friday? To your house? For dinner? We've never had a meal together in 25 years. <laughs> Before she got so sick, Maggie asked you over several times, and you never came. Well, don't you think we should have some dates before we get married? Married? I thought you said you would never marry me. 
What exactly did I say? You said you would never marry me while working for... Oh, I think there's room to have a small reception in a stolen bakery. I'm reminded by seeing Jeffrey that his big sister Patty's flower shop does lovely wedding arrangements. Tom heard very little of Cindy's conversation after that. He sat up straighter in the driver's seat and smiled happily. She's going to marry me, he thought, and she's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much, and you brought us right into that world. It was just wonderful to Thank be you. with you in that story. Thank you. Thank you, and tune in for Monday night's Writer's Read. Thank you so much.